Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the message that I'm giving, forsaken by God, I, I actually, I'm, I'm asking the question, forsaken by God? You know, it's a question. It's not just a statement, it's a question. So, this afternoon, um, I want to present a scenario to you. Uh, let's just say you're having, a, you have, all your life, you have worked for, well, let's just say, you're going to college, and you have spent the last four years of your life, and you have worked extremely hard, you have striven, you have put all kinds of energy, you put all kinds of effort into getting the degree that you're trying to receive, and you, it's like your moment of greatness, or your moment of accomplishment, and you're waiting, you're hoping that your friends, the people that you love the most, will be there for you at your graduation to celebrate with you. But no one comes to your graduation. And it's like, you spent four years doing that, and it's very painful because it's like, wow, the crowning moment, the, the moment when you worked so hard and you were trying to cheat, it didn't happen. Well, today, what I'm going to do is, Psalm 22 asks this question. The question is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, we know this question as the one that Jesus asked when he was about to die on the cross. And, and we also know that the psalm was written, well, you may not know, but I'll just be sharing this. The psalm was written about a thousand years before Jesus came. Psalm 22 was written. And um, I want, you know, the cross hadn't even been invented yet. But what I want you to do is I want you to put yourself in this song. There's lots of levels to this song, okay? And as we read the words of this song, I want you to imagine what it must have felt like to be rejected by men. And, to, and, and I want you to think with me. This is just a question. If God forsook Jesus on the cross, would he forsake you? So we're going to read through this psalm, and we will examine and answer this question. And in the end, we will see the object. Who is the object of Jesus' victory on the cross? Psalm 22 is known, I'm giving some more background information. It's known as the Song of the Cross. The NIV Study Bible has some steady notes in it, and it says uh, that... In this and a few other places, the good guy story, the good guy story, doesn't fit. This poem credited to David, the great king and man after God's own heart, tells of tremendous suffering with no relief from God. It sounds like a mob scene, a lynching. The good guy's enemies have him. They surround him, jeering like a pack of dogs. He is helpless and exhausted. All he can do is just cry out to God. I know some of us have felt this feeling. We felt that people were against us. Sometimes we've had challenges in our job. There's just like, wow, who's with me? There's nobody with me. And there's lots of emotions. And we feel left alone. So the question is, how are we and how was David to pass through this. But really, this psalm is not just about David, it's about Jesus, and it's also about us. The word forsaken, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, uh, the root word is asab, A-Z-A-B. It means to loosen, to relinquish, to permit, to commit self. It also can mean to fail, to forsake, to fortify, to leave, or to refuse. So really what we're looking for in this psalm is the meaning behind the question stated in the first verse. And as we study this psalm together, okay, we will glean information about the imagery, you know, the, the setting, the surroundings. It's, it's amazing what we will experience with David, with Jesus, as we read this psalm. The psalmist is wavering back and forth, crying out in misery, then taking stock of God's wonderful character, then describing his mis misery again. 
The whole poem is a prayer of God. And although his cry has gone up day and night, God remains silent. At least so it seems. So let's begin. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out day by day, but you do not answer by night, and I'm not silent. Yet you are enthroned, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In your fathers, in, our, in you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and they were saved. In you they trusted and they were not disappointed. So putting ourselves in the place of the psalmist, there are times when we cry out to God and it seems like you know, God's just not hearing our prayers and we groan and we feel this overwhelming feeling and no one really understands what we're going through and we're experiencing. Perhaps you know it's a personal trial um, perhaps you're not doing so well on your job, you're having difficulty with somebody and you can't get along, perhaps you're having trouble in your marriage, perhaps it's just finances, it, it can be anything, but our faith is being tested. And we lean hard on God and depend on His promise to deliver us. Sometimes the only way to be delivered is to go through the trial. So the way we overcome, as we were reading here, is by praising God and by making Him the center of our life. And I want you to think of this in Revelation 1. We don't need to go there. I'm just going to describe to you. We see Jesus in the middle of the church. We see Jesus. He's high and lifted up in the middle of the church, but He's down there right in the center. And He's walking around among us. And it says that Jesus is in glory. And he's, you know, he's, he's shining and He's bright and the glory is there. This is the kind of imagery that we see in this psalm. Okay, Jesus is surrounded by angels and the saints and is highly exalted. That's why it says, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. So we continue verse 6 through 11. But David says, or the psalmist says, I am a worm and not a man scorned by men and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet, the psalmist recalls, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. You all know this is a picture of Jesus as he was coming to the place where he was about to die on the cross. And it's amazing that how under the power, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David describes the scene leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, using some of the same words that would later be repeated by Jesus himself. And if you look up the word worm, that's used in verse 6, you'll find that the original Hebrew for this word worm is called tola, and it is not the ordinary, ordinary word for worm. This worm is... This was a worm from which crimson, scarlet, red was obtained. The word describes how Jesus was severely beaten and covered in blood in the hours leading up to his crucifixion. And they describe the feelings that Jesus went through. Now, question, why would David go through so much detail, information describing what Jesus experienced? I mean, he didn't he didn't really know all of this. The Holy Spirit was on him. Could it be, and these are just some questions to think about as we move forward. Could it be so that all people would know that Jesus was a man just like us? Could it be that this psalm would be remembered by the Jews 
throughout the years leading up to the crucifixion and be a witness and a testimony to them so that they would remember what they had read years before he had died. Those that were there with him when he was up on the cross. Could the words of the song be etched in the memory of the Jews who were at the scene of Jesus' death to testify of Jesus as the suffering servant? It is said that Psalm 22 to 24 are called a messianic trilogy. They describe Jesus as Psalm 22, the suffering servant, Psalm 23, the shepherd, and Psalm 24, the Messiah of Israel who would reign over the world and restore the kingdom to Israel. The words of these psalms, these three psalms, were memorized and known by almost all the Jews. Psalm 22 shows the Lord as a suffering servant. 23, the Lord our shepherd. 24, the power of Jesus as the Lord Almighty, the King of glory, to which the Jews were to lift up their heads for their deliverance and their victory. The imagery is powerful and has influenced much of the writings in the New Testament. So as we continue to read from verses 12 to 18, we find this. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan, encircle me. Roaring lions tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. We can really see that detailed description years before Jesus ever came of all the things that Jesus was very likely experiencing. Almost like 360 degrees. What I mean is like, it's like real, you know, dimensional. David is actually describing it. <clears throat> Bashan was the chief cattle raising area in Israel where the best cattle was raised during the time of Israel in the Old Testament. So bulls are powerful and they can pierce a human being. The bulls referred to here were probably the Roman soldiers who whipped and beat Jesus. And when Jesus was on the cross, Roman soldiers surrounded him so that the people would not get so close to him. The beating that Jesus suffered prior to his crucifixion, they dried out his body so that he was very thirsty. If you remember that one statement, he said, I thirst. His heart was like wax because he bled so much and the sun dried him out. And Jesus, excuse me, the Jews refer to uncircumcised people, such as the Romans, as dogs. And Jesus' skin was laid open with his bones showing through from the beating that he suffered. And now, though, the next few verses, we hear the cry from Jesus that God is with him. So we will read 19 through 21. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. Oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouths of the lions. Save me from the horn of the wild oxen. Jesus knew that the only way he was going to be delivered was to by dying on the cross and being resurrected back to life. He knew that his father had not forsaken him. His cry for help suddenly shifts to a shout of victory, beginning in verses 22 to 24. Powerful imagery. Read with me. Think about this. 
Jesus says, or David says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Verse 24, and this is the key. For he, God the Father, has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Did you catch that? I'll read it again. It says, verse 24, For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. That's Jesus. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. God listened to Jesus, his cry for help, and he delivered him by having him go through the resurrection. And yes, he relinquished him to the people, but it was only so that we could have eternal life. But God never turned his back where he just, <laughs> no, God loves his son. He loves Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, he is the way. He became the way, the truth, and the life. A new and living way was created. God would never leave his son alone, even in death. God was with Jesus, just as he is with us in our trials. He was with him through the whole ordeal. Now, some people are going to say, and some people are going to say that, well, God did turn his back on Jesus because Jesus became sin for us. And so let's read the main scripture that some people have this. Okay, and it's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But if you read in the margin, it states that the translation could also be stated, be a sin offering. See, Jesus was a sin offering. Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb of God, slain from the from the foundation of the world. So this was God's plan from the very beginning that Jesus would die as an offering for you and me. He is both God and man, 100% God and 100% man. He never sinned, but he did feel the weight of all of the world's sins, of our sins. And is God the Father able to look at sin? Of course he can look at sin. Think about the time when Adam sin in the Garden of Eden. The communication never stopped between Adam and God. Even after he sinned, you know, Adam was the one who ran away, but God was like, I'm here. People sin. Okay, this unfortunately is the world we live in, but God does not hate us. He does not d despise us because of our sin. Yes, it is our sin that separates us from God, but God is there. He does not move. He is always there. He's waiting for us to come back to Him. And He loves us, and He has already forgiven us. Romans 8, verse 37 and 38 states that not even death, that's what it says in Romans 8, verses 37 to 8, 38. It says that not even death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Yes, God waits with open arms, and He hopes for us to come back to Him. We are the ones, as I said, who move but God continues to love. He does not turn his back on Jesus in that sense. Think back. Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a question. His cry was a testimony to the Jews, to those who read about these, his words in Psalm 22. Many of the words in Psalm 22 are found in the Gospels, in the New Testament. Jesus' life was a witness and a testimony. John 19, verses 28 to 30, says the following. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so, listen what it says, the scripture would be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. 
That's what Jesus said. Verse 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he gave up the spirit. Now, there's a reason I'm reading this, so stay with me. Now, when you go back to Psalm 22 and verse 1, you read the words that are quoted in Matthew 27, verse 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the words that are quoted in John 19, 30, which we just read, it is finished, which translates the meaning of the last verse in Psalm 22 and verse 31, which states, for he has done it. That's what it means. It is finished. He has done it. He connected the first verse of Psalm 22 to the last verse of Psalm 22 so that people could understand that Jesus did the complete work and he he mouthed it out on the cross. He mouthed it out. He said it. And that's why we see these words in Psalm 22. Jesus fulfilled this psalm completely. He is exalted in the Old Testament just like he is in the New. Jesus said these words to fulfill scripture. I read it. So that the scripture would be fulfilled. And to prove to the Jews and all people that he is the Messiah. And so as we go back to Psalm 22, verses 25 to 31, then we find the reason, the object, the reason why Jesus went to the cross and suffered so deeply. We find the scope of the power of his resurrection. Suddenly we move from lament, you know, sadness and pain and suffering and despair to victory, to victory and joy. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David is inspired to write about the victory celebration, which belongs to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and to us. It is the victory song of celebration through the Lamb. Jesus is victorious in life and death, and we are with him in this victory. And so with that in mind, really thinking about that imagery, let's read what verses 25 to 31 says. And Jesus is saying, from you, from the Father, comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. Verse 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. He doesn't stop, though. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done it. Jesus' salvation is complete. It is totally complete. It's not partial. It is complete. So, can we see the imagery here? A great time of feasting, joy, celebration over the whole world when finally Jesus draws all people groups to himself. He died on the cross to give us life. He calls us his brothers. In Hebrews 2 verses 10 and 13, the author of Hebrews quotes this part of this psalm. Let's read it, Hebrews 2 verses 10. It says, in bringing many sons unto glory, it was fitting that, that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. And this is quoted, verse 12 is quoted in Psalm 22. He says, I will declare, I will declare your name 
to my, to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. That's right. Jesus is going to sing the praises for the glorious victory that he has won in us because we have accepted him and we are his army who, who work for him. Who We are his witnesses. We are the testimony that he is testifying about. And the Jews that were there at the cross when Jesus died and when Jesus said, my God, my God, when he asked this question, why have you forsaken me? It was that statement or that question that Jesus was letting the Jews know that I am the one that you were waiting for. But they waited for Jesus thinking that at that time Jesus was going to restore the kingdom to Israel, but he was not going to do that then. But that whole, all the words that Jesus said on the cross, they were a witness, they were a testimony of him. It was like he was sharing the gospel through dying on the cross. And he has included you and I, every single one of us, in his salvation. We are in Christ. That is why Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be in him, he would be in us. That the Father would be in us, and we would be in the Father so that we could all be one in Christ. So I will answer that question. Did God did God forsake Jesus on the cross? He loved him from the beginning through his resurrection. God did not forsake Jesus and neither will God forsake us. He wants us to invite him into our hearts and be refreshed and renewed daily. Psalm 22 is a prophecy of the future, of the salvation of the world. Jesus is making all things new. So Jesus' salvation includes all. And he is alive forevermore.